Um, but I'll go ahead and well, I'm glad everybody's here. So again, people just start rolling in. This is being recorded. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have um, Dr. Bert Mandelbaum with us today. He, um, you can see all of his accolades right there on the screen, but um, the exciting part is that he's a team physician for the men's national team who are on their way to Qatar this fall. Um, but, you know, in his spare time when he's not doing that, he, <laughs> you can see all the things he does here, um, works the MLS, but he is part of the prestigious staff at um, Cedar sinai which personally holds a dear place for me as I've had made way too many ACL reconstructions because I'm, uh, <laughs> don't pay attention to all the rules you should be following, which is bad. Um, but they are um, a great partner. We're excited. Um, Robert Alvarado and Karen Ladnier are also joining us, and they've been integral in bringing this partnership together. And so we are excited to have the first of many um, webinars with the staff from um, Cedar. So I am going to hand this over to Dr. Mendelbaum and let him lead you through his presentation and some amazing content that will help not only uh, get you excited about what's happening with the World Cup team and the, um, the national team, but also as you go into the fall season, really preparing yourself and your athletes and looking at injury prevention and whatnot. So again, like I said, we're gonna, you can type in your questions as the presentation is going on, but we will hold those to the end. So Dr. Mendelbaum, I will turn this over to you. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, and, and thank you uh, for allowing us to be part of AYSO. Uh, we at Cedar sinai Curlin Jove Institute are so excited about this relationship, the collaboration, the ability to work together, that we can enhance the lives of our future young soccer players. And really, that is my talk tonight, is we wanted to introduce uh, by request, people want to hear about our preparations for our World Cup in Qatar just in a few months. But also, how about some of those lessons for our next generation who are going to be the next Christian Pulisic, who are going to be the next scientist, doctor, artist, movie maker, whatever they choose? How do we enhance their lives? And how do we think about the game of football and how it makes a difference for all of us? Well, it starts out that when we think about the sport of soccer, as it's called football around the world, there are, believe it or not, 300 million participants. And I have been all over the world, as you can see, that you see soccer goals and people expressing themselves, living their lives through football in so many ways that in and of itself, it's quite motivating for all of us to be part of that. So just like them, all of you, one of the participants. So how about this relationship that we have with Cedar sinai At the end, our FIFA Medical Center of Excellence is really designed to develop and maintain a preeminent world-class global center for taking care of sports medicine, clinical practice, team physician activities, education, and research to make what we do better over time. The purpose that we have is really focused on how do we optimally impact you, the public, and our patients, our players, through our synergies of innovation, develop new technologies, education, communication, team physician, and basic clinical care. For us, that really what we call it codifies what we do at the Curl and Job Institute in Cedar sinai And we want to do this with clarity and authenticity. Well, my story, and we could talk about a lot of things that I do, but there I was in 1994, and here I am in 2022. And uh, I've been very happy to carry that flag behind me for those 28 years working with the USA national team. It's brought me through 11 World Cups uh, and six Olympics, and it's been an amazing experience. And uh, I am very proud of it, and it's been a high point in my life. So with that, it really comes down to how do we think about our medical program? Well, our program, and specifically the national team, is, is designed to manage the safety and health of the athlete through three pillars, 
prevention, performance, and injury care. And most importantly, keeping our athletes anti uh, and doping compliant. So when you look at this for me as a team doctor, it breaks down to prevention. And our lives have become really complicated in the last few years with COVID-19. But we think about that and who could play and bubbles and testing and all these details. It has been a major effort, a team effort. But like always, we have to think about sudden death, heat illness, concussions, ACL tear, stress fractures, groin pain, and arthritis later on. We think about performance. We've got to look at fitness, strength, fluids, nutrition, altitude adaptation, heat adaptation, and again, keeping our athletes drug-free. And lastly, when we're injured or sick, we have to make a good diagnosis and then we have to treat our athletes. And guess what? What's the most important thing is returning the athletes back to the field. Number one, all the time. That's how we think and that's how we want to think as we go forward. So what do we do for our team? We think about competition specifics, which is number 10. Is it a World Cup? Where is it? Is it played in 100 degrees or is it played in 20 degrees? When is it? What time of year? Heat, altitude, humidity, disease issues, COVID-19, Zika, malaria, dengue, swine flu, yellow fever are all things I've had to deal with in my career. So you've got to become expertise at all these about competition specifics. Next, we have to think about the elite athlete and performance specificity. What level is the athlete? How about age criteria for kids? We talk about different national teams. Gender, are women different than the men and girls and boys? It is different. There are different physical and physical, physiological characteristics. How about fitness, nutrition, heat and altitude again? chronobiology, where you are and what time of, of the day. How many times have we had showcases taking young athletes to Florida and playing games at nine o'clock in the morning, at six in the morning for our California kids out here? So understanding chronobiology and how to get kids to adapt to it is really key. The psychology of the game, interaction with families are all important. So this is what we call performance specificity. And to do that, we need a team. I'm always surrounded by multiple physicians as the team doctor, but there's my team. It's about trainers, physicians, surgeons, psychologists, psych, physical therapists, nutritionists, specialists, podiatrists, chiropractors, biomechanists, administrators, general managers are all part of my team. I go nowhere without this team because I'm ineffectual. I need everybody all the time. It's the team's Team, which is, brings us to number seven. How about the relationships that we have with respect to players like this, old and new, with understanding the status with respect to club and the national team? It's important to communicate at all times. And we have a very comprehensive relationship, especially with Zoom today in August of 2022, and communications with every club around the world. It gets complicated, but we're doing a pretty good job of it right now. And we have to think about prevention, something we'll talk about that's essential in our kids. But we think about the PCMA, it starts with that pre-competition medical assessment. We think about the 11 plus as a prevention program, minimizing knee injuries, muscle injuries, groin and ankle injuries going forward. I keep harping this about doping and making sure our kids and our players are staying away from all kinds of banned substances at all times. We have therapeutic use exemptions if, if our kids and players are going to play, they're taking a medicine, and how do we go about that? There are rules to that that we've got to adhere to. Replacement player and rules. How many players can travel? 18, 21, 23. How are they replaced? Whether it be the big national team, the U14s or an AYSO, all those things are really important. And lastly, the FIFA diploma, 
continuing medical education for all of us in the, in the medical world are trying to learn more about football and soccer medicine. And this FIFA is helping us do that going forward. It brings us to the concept of prevention and the PCMA, which is critical. Everybody asks when this got really popular. I happened to be in France when Mark Vivian Foy in July of 2003 in, in the Confederations Cup dropped to the field then ultimately succumbed to his heart stopping. And from that, we learned that we were ill-prepared. We're ill-prepared to understand how to diagnose this beforehand. We're ill-prepared in terms of how to understand how to resuscitate these athletes. And since that point, in the last 19 years, out came the pre-competition medical assessment. And with that, what we do with that, we use that at all levels, our national teams, the clubs, professional, recreational, right down to the youth. Because it's not just these players that have these problems. We see players all over the world at one time or another having the same type of problem. We've got to do the pre-competition medical assessment for all our athletes at all times, at certain age groups, and we'll speak to that in a bit. Understand the concept of 11, using the 11 rules for prevention and, and being able to have our athletes compete in a healthy way. We've learned that this prevention program, as we can see in this study that we did in the NCAA male soccer players, we found that we could reduce anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL injury, by 76.5% just by doing a warm up before their practice. 76.5% of the ACLs can be prevented. It's not 100%, but we can reduce the number of injuries in a very statistical way. And again, it's only carries to, it's only one of the injuries. How about these hamstring injuries in our athletes? They are the most burdensome problem that we have in this population. But guess what? The 11 plus is also extremely successful in this population, as you can see here, the number is statistically different in those athletes that are doing this type of preparation in preventing hamstring strains going forward. So we think this is really important going forward. How about other protocols? In competition prevention protocols, understanding who's at the field, understanding who the players are in the field and what we do. We have what we call a timeout. In every game, we come together as our team and we go over our emergency action protocols. Who's doing CPR, where they're doing it, where the ambulance is. It's critical to our success going forward. But we also know things, especially in hot climates, if you're playing soccer in Florida today or in Texas or in Southern California, we have to think about breaks and hydration breaks. And this is me, what I was part of one of the first hydration breaks because we didn't think this way in international soccer and football. And this is a wet globe monitor that we can assess this. And from that, we decide when and how we do these hydration water breaks. Doping control, as we spoke about, is really important to every competition. Sudden cardiac death, concussions, injury transport, injury surveillance, are all part of the total protocol. So we have to think about all of these things every time our players get on the field every time. And I'll translate to not only to the youth, but specifically for AYSO going forward in our next part as we talk about this. As we talk about concussions, we know that we can find that it's about 2% of our injuries going forward. And we realize, especially on our national team level, we expect one in every 20 matches or 1.65 concussions for every thousand hours of participation. Now, I'm gonna show you this. And this is from World Cup 94. Some of the ones who are oldies and goodies remember this. Tab Ramos in the 42nd minute went down. You can see there, it was a big day, Stanford Stadium. The score is 0-0. Zero, zero. 
Leonardo turns Tab Ramos. He turns to the left, takes an elbow to the head, and he goes down. You can see Lexi Lawless and the rest of the players standing around worrying what we're going to do, how we're going to manage him. Zero, zero, the biggest game of the whole national team experience ever. Zero, zero, and our best player goes down. And from this, we learned many lessons. It was a big injury. He did not come back. He had a fracture. He had a hematoma. He had a concussion. But we learned a lot from that. And many of the lessons we learned from that translated into the policies and procedures that we use in FIFA, that we use in Major League Soccer, that we use in AYSO. And basically, it comes down to when someone gets injured to the head. There are red flags, intense pain, seizure, loss of consciousness. We give, the referees should give the coaches, the physicians, the trainers, as much time as they need to sort this thing out. And this has been a major change because this didn't exist 10 years ago. It does now because of the kinds of things, having us, the medical team, looking at these injuries analytically and critically to make it safer and better for our players. We mentioned about the water breaks. It was the first time, believe it or not, in 2014, and there I was when I was assigned to FIFA, and we were in um, Fortaleza, Brazil, and there's the Mexican team playing Holland. It was the very first time we did a hydration break. Everybody said we couldn't do it. We shouldn't do it. It would change the spirit of the game, and today it's now a standard. And how we do it is we assess it before the game, and we need to do this for at every age group. Is the temperature too high? And if so, we have to make sure there are drinks, ice, towels, hydration that are available to the athletes at all times. And also shifting the time of the game will really help the situation. It brings us to number four, the equipment. If we're out there taking care of our players, we need to have all the best equipment in our emergency bag. So that's critical, and it's critical to everyone getting on the field with athletes anywhere it is in the world. Communications are critical for the athlete. We need to communicate through coaches, general managers, the athletes, the parents, the family, and always be aware of the media going forward. And again, when you're dealing with a team like these, these are very critical issues that we need to think about. And also communicate with the local organizers in terms of what's happening, how it's happening, and how we will solve the issue at hand. And lastly, getting back to the respective clubs of the respective players. Number two, anytime you have an injury with x-rays, MRIs, the bottom line, you have to make the diagnosis sufficiently. We have to lead to the steps of treatment and as I said in the beginning, it's all about return to play. That's what everybody says at every injury. Doc, when am I going to get back to play? And very lastly, when you take your athletes like this, and number one, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's about being the best doctor. We took Hippocrates and his oath that said, the health of my patient will always be my first consideration. And that's how we take care of our national team. It's our top 10, we integrate it together, but it's always about prevention, performance and injury care. And as I said, the lessons we learn in World Cup 22 are applied to our kids today. And the principles for our young athletes are basic issues, such as these experiences of playing on the soccer field drive happiness to kids, to families, to lives going forward. Sports and exercise remains our only fountain of youth at all ages. We have to understand as professionals what the benefits are, what the risks are at all levels. And I'll go through that in just a minute or two. And how can we impact the health of our kids and make them better adults is really what we're gonna focus on. Turns out, Prevention is always the key. Now, we certainly know about soccer moms always asking the question, but she always asks are 
my Johnny wants to get back and be a professional athlete. We don't have this data for soccer, but we have it for football. The odds of becoming a professional football player is one in 6,666. Basketball, one in 14,000. And baseball, any baseball, is one in 1,200. And I would probably put soccer somewhere between these numbers. So the odds aren't great they're going to become professional athletes. So what are we doing here? Yes, there's a Christian Pulisic, and there are 26 members of our national team, but there are also going to be 14 million other kids out there in AYSO participating in soccer every weekend with all of us cheering them on every chance we get. So what are we doing and why are we doing it? Well, if you look at this article from Stephen Blair in 2009, fiscal inactivity is the biggest health problem of the 21st century. The biggest problem. So we've got to keep our kids active. And we have to remember the trilogy, performance, prevention, and care of our athletes at all stages, at all times. And like in AYSO, it's the safety and health of our kids that's critical to the kids' zone. It's about injury and illness care, performance optimization, drug fee, and most importantly, at every step, teaching parents and kids alike fair play. And that's what the kids zone is about. So how do we relate this to them? How do we optimize and facilitate this interaction weekend after weekend, kids all over our country? Well, the first thing you have to understand this epidemic, it's a lot about too much and too little. There's an urbanization that we have where we have less exercise, no physical education, too much transportation, too much television, and I won't even speak about social media. Fast food, malnutrition is the most common cause of immune deficiency going forward. So we're seeing this urbanization, not only in our country, but all over the world, and we're struck with too much and too little. So how do we think about the benefits about what we're doing? We look at the physiological benefits of our kids. We know they're more fit, they're stronger. They'll have lower body fat, lower triglycerides and cholesterol. Our physical activity is our evolutionary heritage. We've been designed this way as species for physical activity. As a consequence, when we do that, we get all the bounties, all the benefits that go with it. We get physical benefits, such as a healthy appearance. We know what that looks like. We know what it feels like. We get issues, psychological benefits, better self-esteem, better schoolwork, better teamwork, and less depression, less alcohol, and less teen pregnancy going forward. The benefits are incredibly strong. The sociological benefits. Kids and the parents are more successful. The family, school, job dynamics are better. The social network in a community is better. Respect for girls and women. Also, less HIV, less malnutrition. And one of the things we see, especially in underdeveloped countries, instead of having six children, People who are educated and participate in sports, the number drops in half to three children, which is better for our civilizations around the world. Also, the great thing about sport, as we've seen from Jordan Morris, who is an amazing national team player, also plays for the Seattle Sounders. And most people don't know this about him, but he's a type one diabetic. And what we've learned from people like him is that we could use the sport as a tool. We could use as a therapeutic intervention for HIV, maltrition, obesity, recovering from infectious disease, cystic fibrosis, attention deficit disorder, diabetes like we see in Jordan Morris, Down syndrome as we've seen in Special Olympics, and cardiopulmonary transplantation. So all of these aspects of issues of health and disease 
can be helped by soccer as a therapeutic intervention. The last area I'll speak to is about the prevention. And as Einstein said, the intelligent can certainly solve problems, but it's really the genius that will prevent their occurrence. And prevention is a big thing for our kids. Whatever we do and however we do it, we have to minimize the risks of physical injury at all times. And what are the risks? Let me tell you a couple of them. They break down to two categories. One is the trauma and the other is the repetitive overuse injuries. The trauma, we always want to minimize head and concussions and musculoskeletal injury. And the repetitive are more stress injuries, especially in kids that are growing and we can overuse the growth plate. And again, there's nothing new about this. As Aristotle told us in 331 BC that Olympic victors were those. And again, unfortunately, at that time, the only ones participating were men, not women. Those men who did not squander their powers by early and overtraining. He should have said both men and women, but that wasn't the case at that point in time. So we look at injury risk, but even though we're talking about this, I don't want to overstate this because you have to understand for the U10 age, there's only one injury per 100. The U14, 7.7 injuries per 100. And most of these injuries, quite frankly, are not very serious. And in this article and other articles, we conclude that soccer appears to be a safe activity for adolescents and children. But that said, we still want to make it safer going forward. And we bring up issues. We talked about the heat for kids. And again, specifically, we're addressing our kids. Who's at greater risk? It's these young kids. And these tournaments that occur in places like Lancaster or Sarasota, Florida, or Arizona, when you have these tournaments over days, we've got to think about that because they, these young kids, really get heated. We see a greater incidence in the extremes of heat and humidity. And most importantly, and this is really an important thing, most situations, these are preventable. How are we going to do that? We're going to glycogen and carbo load 24 hours before. We're going to use sports drinks and fluids before, during, and after. And if you have the luxury of a cooling jacket, you could put, put it on them at half time. Or it could just be cool towels that are soaked in some type of a cooler and putting it on the athletes. Uh, during their breaks. Also, heat acclimatization is trainable. Here in California, believe it or not, it's very temperate in West Los Angeles where I live and practice. But when we go to, we have kids go to other places in Arizona or Florida, they are not acclimatized to that, but you can become acclimatized and you can adapt, but you just have to know how to do that. How about the issue of balls? Now, everybody's asking the question about what size of ball, what age, and how do we do it? Well, let's start with the big one. It's the size five that everybody uses. And if you're 12 years and above, that ball is for you. The four is best suited for the eight to 12 year olds. And the three is best suited for the eight years and younger. And the ones are used for skill training and also for rehabilitation that we do sometimes with our athletes after they're injured. So that's what we call the five, the four, the three, and the one. And I think it's a good thing to understand those basic principles. Now, why are we even talking about ball size and details and things like that? Because it really leads into this issue of heading soccer ball. Now, we all know that this has been a big issue in our sport for a long time. And it was litigation back in 2015 and U.S. soccer came up with a new guideline in terms of the fact that if you're 10 years old or younger, you no longer could head the soccer ball. And if you were between 11, 13, you could only do this during practice and not games. So the approach that U.S. soccer had was how do we make our game safer for our kids? How do we minimize the injury to the head? And 
make our kids happier and we absorb the benefits and not the risks. And that was really the motivation of these protocols. There's been some adaptation since, but principally that's what we're doing today. As we move from the head, we talk about ACL injuries. And this is some data that we can show from, this is called PHIS data from pediatric hospitals. And you can see here that the incidence of ACL injuries is going up, not only in the 10 and younger, but also the 11 and 14 and 15 to 18 year old. Why? You can see that many times if you look over in a soccer field, look to your left, look to your right, you see some of these kids look like giraffes that have just come out of the womb. They look just like that. And they have a tendency to jump and land just like that. That's not good because if you're doing that and you're playing soccer, there's a good chance you're going to go ahead and tear your anterior cruciate ligament. We have looked at this very closely in terms of trying to figure out how the ACL is torn, especially if it's a non-contact ACL. And I was part of several different groups, uh, including the International Olympic Committee, trying to sort this out. We looked at anatomy, hormones, we looked at equipment, shoe and surface. And in the end, it turned out to be what you were just seeing, the, the landing and jumping where you look like you're a, a giraffe coming out of the womb as neuromuscular control phenomena, movement patterns, position patterns, with a major factor, as you can see here, that leads to ACL tears going forward. Now, we, we look at this as a big problem. This particular national team that you remember, look at how many ACL reconstructions were done. 45% of our starting 11 had an ACL reconstruction. So it's something we have to learn how to deal with. We have to learn how to manage it. I have to learn how to fix it. We have to learn how to rehabilitate and we have to learn how to return our athletes back to sport. But we also have a prevention program. And it started with prevent injury enhanced performance. We developed here in Santa Monica called the PEP program. It was about avoidance, flexibility, strengthening, plyometrics and agilities. And you could do this at the first 10 minutes of any soccer practice. It looks like this. It's warm up and you could do plyometric strengthening and sports specific agility drill. This program was so successful that FIFA came to us and we morphed it, calling it the 11 plus. And as we talked about, this was a study we did earlier and found that we could reduce ACL injuries by 76%. It's exciting to think about all these things. And as a consequence, we come away with certain recommendations for our kids. One, we always want to optimize the benefits and minimize the risks with prevention. And we've talked about preventing so many different things going forward. I also want to say we've got to recognize that the child is not just a small adult. That is a child. And there are specificities that go into making that child a successful adult. We always have to remind it of that going forward. And to that end, it's important to understand that there are complex physical, physiological, psychological differences by age and gender. And each of us as professionals managing these groups of athletes have to understand those specificities. Also, head injuries are a low incidence, but our goal is to get to zero tolerance if possible. It'll never happen, but it's our goal at all times. We also know, as we can see, when you look at this graphic, it's about raising our kids to be happy. It's about sports, fitness, and exercise is essential, therefore, for all children at all times. We want to optimize their physical, their physiological, and psychological benefits. As you can see here, child activity makes child health, child health makes adult health. And adult activity and adult health make all of us healthy going forward, which are really the principles of AYSO and US soccer. If you learn healthy lifestyle, 
as a child, the benefits will always carry on in your life going forward. And that's a key thing. And one of the most important take home points of tonight. With that, I want to thank all of you for being there. Thank you for the invitation. We get to kick off a great opportunity of our relationship with Cedar sinai Curl and Job Institute and AYSO. It allows us to kick off. I don't know how many days we have until November 21st, our first game. We are really excited for this. And uh, hopefully the medical team, the team's team, will optimize the performance of our national team as well as all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mendelbaum. Um, so appreciate that. So much information. And just um, I did get a couple of questions as you were talking about if this is recorded and will be available. Yes, it will be. So um, it'll be once uh, this is finished, I'll kind of edit it into package and then send that link to everybody that registered for this webinar. But I did want to um, you can put your questions in the chat chat if you have them. Um, I do have a question I wanted to ask you to build off of what you just ended with in regards to prevention and, and looking at that. Um, so what is the earliest age that kids should start um, injury prevention program, like the FIFA 11 or the, the you know, the performance, the, was it the PEP? Um, like what age should they be doing that um, when they're out there practicing? Well, I think prevention should be part of every age. And, and we have developed uh, 11 plus for kids, PEP for kids, uh, because we're interested in trying to minimize at all ages. So why do we take our kids on the field and we stretch? Why do we warm up? So prevention is part of every practice, every game at all times. It gets more specific and more sophisticated as you get into the 13 and 14 year old. But I think prevention in the simplest form for the youngest kid is really a very important thing. As we get on up to the 10 to 14 year olds, it gets more sophisticated where we wanna make sure as we've shown you in terms of landing and jumping, not being in this what we call dynamic valgus position. Again, and then from 14 to 18, it gets more intense and we should be doing that probably at least twice a week for 15 minutes doing 11 plus or PEP program to prevent, especially in our, our girls, uh, ACL injuries. Yes, as someone who could speak from uh, very much my first ACL uh, tear was when I was 16. So um, was not a fun time, but uh, we do have um, Lauren, uh, I'm not going to say your last name because I will butcher it. And so Lauren Kay um, asked, what does the 11 plus program consist of? Um, what can you go through some of the specifics on that? Yeah, it, it's a um, it's really if we go back in our slides here, we'll have. Uh, we'll just go over this here just real quickly right there. It's really five different aspects to it. This is the PEP program and basically the. Um, the uh, 11 plus really more from this. It's about teaching people how to avoid those positions, how to give you more flexibility, strengthening, learning how to land and jump successfully, and also figuring out the agilities and moving better, landing better as you see here. And again, in the end of the, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is really avoid these type of incorrect positions, teaching just the avoidance characteristics of teaching them this way versus this way is really essential going forward. So the, the prevention program is, is really that, as you can see. Those are the five tenets. There are videos of, uh, that are available online for both the PEP as well, as you can see here, uh, PEP as well as the FIFA 11 plus. Uh, and I think part of uh, AYSO membership, if they request them, we could send links and other type of, uh, uh, of connections to this material. Well, we did just have, it's funny you say that, because we do have a couple of coaches ask here, is there um, a stretch plan or prevention program, like you were saying, but those videos would be perfect that they want to do with their young athletes. Um, 
So if that is something we can provide, we can send those links um, out along with this um, recording. So, um, and the, just so you know, uh, I think Nisha asked this, the FIFA 11, Scott is on here, but he's traveling. So he may want to pop in. Scott, I'm not sure if you wanted to mention anything about that we have worked in the 11 plus into our training as well, or recommended training. I'm not sure. Yeah, just that we've, we've had it in the past. Uh, we haven't specified it for different age groups, which we probably should do. Uh, and I think that would be something we could work with uh, the doctor on is kind of grouping into different ages and, and integrating it in more formally. But it's a great program. I've used it in my own teams and I'm, and I'm a big fan of it. So we've got some familiarity with it, but I think we need to specify it a little bit more. This is something that uh, I believe that we really uh, want to bring to uh, this relationship with AYSO is helping with, uh, because prevention, we can speak about prevention, but it gets complicated because a lot of people don't quite understand it. And then they're not compliant with the different coaches who say, well, we don't have enough time. They just get out on the field for 45 minutes and we can't spend all our time doing this. Well. These are essential aspects to it. Maybe when they're eight years old, they don't need to spend that much time. But when they're 14 or 15, as we all know, that's when it becomes really essential. Well, it is just that learning aspect, right? So if you're just, it's like anything. If you're learning right now that you have to have that in, we all know as adults on here, if you don't warm up and you just work out, the next day is not so pleasant. So um you know, it's just for our kids, definitely um, so important. So I think this is valuable. Um, I, to that point, I know you had mentioned the strain that tournaments, multi-day tournaments and, um, you know, different weather conditions put on them. Is there something that, are there guidelines that exist on how many games or per day or minutes per played per day is, is recommended for kids in different age age groups? You know, I, I, I've always pushed for this. I, I can't say I've seen it. I know there's been resistance to it. There are different factions of, of you know, people saying you could play two or three games in a day over a weekend. And I don't know. I mean, we can't get our professionals to play on a Wednesday and a Saturday let alone play two or three games on a, on a weekend. Um, so I, I think that is excess. And, and I think we have to play, play not harder, but play smarter. That, you know, if, if you have the most competitive athlete, we're trying to make that athlete be the best they can be, there's one track. If, if we're trying to create something that is for a, a large number of people, on the more recreational level, still competitive, but on the more recreational level, we have to be smarter and not work harder, not push them harder. Uh, I think then they can get burned out. They, they can develop some of these overuse tendencies. And when they develop overuse tendencies, it's not fun for them. And if it's not fun, they're not gonna wanna participate. So my bias here is less is more. And we have to think about how to make the activity better for them with not playing six games on a weekend, for example. We know what that looks like on Sunday night, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. So to that point, what age do you, I mean, there's a ton of debate about this topic. Um, what age do you recommend that a youth athlete start specializing in I, just one sport? You know, again, this is not a binary issue and it's not a binary answer to your question. Um, I think there's some people like you, if you look at a Christian Pulisic, um, you know, age 13 or 14 or, or Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, how we deal with that individual in terms of, of super specialization. I believe that 14 is probably the time that you can start doing super specialization for two reasons. One, I think that many of the athletes who were at our highest level uh, played other sports and continue to play other sports. They try to, 
uh, because it helps them in, in their soccer activity. The guys all always play soccer, tennis. They play golf. Um, they want to play basketball more. Um, and again, that's even when they're more at, at an advanced level. So I think there are a lot of benefits to keep not only playing soccer, but also playing some levels. You can't play if you're playing at a very high level of soccer. You can't do the same for lacrosse or basketball or baseball, uh, but you can do some because I think you absorb the benefits without the risks of doing too much. So in answer to your question, the number is probably 14. And at 14, things begin to change in many different ways. Uh, but I still advocate for not truly super specializing where it eliminates all other sports. Right. Because I think they still get the benefit, especially in the area of cross training to teach them. Many times we want our athletes to swim and bike and do other fitness things like yoga and Pilates um, that are other disciplines, other exercise, other sports while they're performing, competing and training in soccer. No, it's a, a really good thought. You know, you don't even realize the benefit you get. I played a bunch of different sports until, you know, I did different things. So, and then cheerleading is what took me down. So good times. Um, <laughs> like the worst. Um, we did get a, um, somebody in the question said that this this um, website doesn't work here so is there other um for the acl prevention is there another link that we can send them probably yeah, after? We'll, send, we'll, we'll send them uh we'll, we'll send them make sure one that's functional okay sounds it, it good. may have evolved it, it's been up there since 19 that one but we'll make sure we get contemporary uh links perfect um and then to that point on the specialization going the opposite way um, you know, we have, when we start our kids off, especially in our AYSO programs, they start off at three and a half, three years old, but it's really focused on that FMS, you know, that, um, fine, you know, motor skills development. What do you recommend that should span? Not just, you know, because a lot of times people want to see the cutest soccer game out there at three years old, but kids don't even know how to kick the ball. So what is your, what is your recommendation on that FMS, that age span for that, um, you know, should it go from three to six, from three to five, you know, three to eight? <laughs> well, I think that part of what we're trying to do is improve the physical, the physiological, psychological, and sociological aspects of these young kids. Um, and if you look at the physical characteristics and the benefits they can get, um, I think in the, those young age groups, we could still work on those things helping kids how to run. You know, my wife always complains that no one ever taught her how to run. No wonder why they're tearing the young females are tearing their ACLs. Um, again, teaching people how to run, um, how to get stronger, how to think comprehensively about fitness. Uh, you know, we were brought up with the President's Council of Physical Fitness, where it was about sit-ups and push-ups and chin-ups and these kind of activities now, nowadays, it's not that common to have the President's Council involved in that, but it's the AYSO that does that activity. It may not be done as well in the schools. So in reality, it, it may be the responsibility of groups like this to really help our kids with absorbing the benefits of a sport and exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So again, working it into this kind of pre-performance, you know, um, saying, you know, how do we use our body? I had kids, I do four or five you, and I literally had a five-year-old who could kick the ball, run through cones and a four-year-old who couldn't even swing their leg, you know? So it's just like, how do I work? How I worked with them was so vastly different. And you figure age doesn't determine, I think that you would agree age does not determine functionality right and that for fine motor skill development every child is different um so yeah, i mean when you think about you know how many different looks does a 10 year old have you have 10 year olds look like they're five and some of them look like they're 15 yes so you know it's it's where they are on the developmental scale physically psychologically emotionally uh, all these things must be considered understanding 
our kids. Definitely. So I've, we have a question from one of our, our uh, attendees as well. Um, is it okay for kids to play different sports at one time or is it uh, at one time? So soccer and basketball, or is it better for them to play it through different sports throughout the year? Well, it, it's different in different parts of our country for obvious reasons. When you, when you live in, in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, um, is very different than here in Southern California. The pressures, uh, you, you have a cadence and a rhythm of the year. It's okay, it's the fall, and then it's, you could you could play football and soccer, and then it's winter, and then then you have spring. And, and so it, everything has a seasonality to it. I, I really believe that I, I, I like the cadence of change and, and the rhythm of change that uh, there should be constant variations and rest phases and then more high intensity phases. Um, I do believe that they should play multiple sports, but my rule is they can only practice one sport a day. I, I ask them to avoid multiple practices in any given day. So if they play soccer on Tuesday and Thursday, they go to baseball practice on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I think that's the ideal. But there are many times kids are, are doing two practices in a day. And in that situation, certainly less is not more. More is a problem. And, and you get into some uh, burnout. You get into some repetitive overuse injuries and stress injuries at that point. Definitely. Um... And so I, to that, I know we were talking about the difference in a child that's 10 looks, one looks five and one looks 15 or has the ability. What um, are your thoughts on the relative age effect of playing up and down? So, you know, you've got an early mature and you have a late mature. How do you see that affecting? Is that a sociological or, you know, it's a physiological, but is it also, is there a sociological um, effect on, in that area? Well, you know, I think in, when it comes to athletic performance for kids, I think there's there's a debate about this, and there are different individuals who, who discuss and argue this on different levels. If I'm in a in, in a national U.S. men's national team group, and we're discussing how to find the next Christian Pulisic, um, it's one discussion. And if I'm in a discussion where we're talking about grassroots soccer in America and using it as a healthy lifestyle enhancing activity where kids are mostly recreational but competitive, it's a different discussion and a different answer. Certainly, if we go to the high performance situation, the next Pulisic or Messi is going to pop out at age 12 or 13. He's going to be that kid, that young man or that young woman that is dancing around everybody else scoring six or seven goals in an afternoon uh, and runs faster and jumps higher uh, than any of the other. And, and when you look at what that takes to develop that child into becoming a high performance athlete from Olympic development programs, clubs, and things of that nature, um, that's a whole different track. When it comes to recreation and competitiveness, I think it's it's okay to be more conservative, playing up and playing down. Um, don't really have the same implications because the pressures of time are not upon them. So I think it's it's a different situation, and a lot of it depends on the goals of the respective uh, the two respective situations that we're dealing with. Do you happen to see, because, you know, the interesting part is, like I said, I also deal with the young people and I had some of those kids that could run around everybody, but they're still five years old. So psychologically, they just like, they're making animal noises alongside the kids who are not, but they're running around them scoring goals, but then they're jumping up and doing weird things. Is it still, you think, healthy and for their mental kind of maturity for them to stay with their age group, even though they are in scoring all the goals around all of the kids? 
I think every child is different. And I think these kind of, you have to consider the physical, the physiological, the sociological issues. And But my rule of thumb is, uh, regardless of what uh, they're good at, whether it be at playing the viola or a protege in opera or a spelling bee or soccer, that, you know, if, if they have a gift and there are some kids that are extremely intelligent with very high IQs, they need to go to the next level, even though they don't have the same emotional characteristics. But that becomes another part of the challenge in dealing with them. The same is true for soccer. I had a son who, who um, I have a son, but when he was uh, 12, um, he was that kid scoring the five or six goals. And next thing you know, there was, we had to drive long distances to this number one club and play Dallas Cup. And it, it, it became a whole different thing. And my litmus test was that as long as he could adapt to it and if he's doing his homework in the car, if he's if his, if his schoolwork was doing well uh, and he was happy coming home, then I'm okay. Um, and I think that's what everybody, every family should look at respectively to see if, if this is consistent with your family values, that your child is happy in what they're doing, uh, that they're not stressed out and they look at it as pressure rather than fun. At the end of the day, this has to be fun and it has to be a positive health enhancing activity. No, thank you. That makes, you know, a lot of sense. <laughs> um, and um, so I guess like my, you know, as we're wrapping up, you know, because I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I did have one final question when we were talking about concussion. What is the recommended time for them? You know, because my nephew, when he got a concussion in football, American football, he was like, I'm fine. I can go next week. And we're like, what are you talking about? Um, what is that recommended time for, you know, depending upon age um, that you, you would give advice for? Well, I think the rule of thumb and there are a lot of very sophisticated uh, methods of doing psychoneurological baseline testing and comparing. That's the way we do it when we're dealing with collegiate and other professional athletes. Um, you give them a test, um, a psychoneurologic test at the base, and then when someone has a head injury, you compare that. So you have a, an objective comparison there. It's called impact testing. Um, then you have to look at and probably the most important thing is what kind of symptoms are they having? Do they have headaches? Do they have memory loss? Do they have dizziness? Are they feeling nauseous? So all of these things, the symptom complex becomes really important. And the bigger the head injury is, the more symptoms there are. And so as a consequence, the number one objective is no symptoms for a period of time. Once they have that period of time, 24, 48 hours, you can slowly advance their physical and exercise activity. It used to be thought that rest was the best treatment. Nowadays, it's been proven that actually low level, systematic, gradual, progressive exercise, once they have no symptoms, is the best way. So I think that's the most important thing. No symptoms, no headache, no nausea, no dizziness, no evident, obviously, any seizures. Um, and they could begin to start advancing after 24 or 48 hours. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, all of this will be um, record is all recorded, and we'll send you this link as well as the other links that we um, alluded to in regards to um, you know stretching. Um, recommended stretching programs and whatnot. Um, our next one, we did ask this question, Dr. Mandelbaum was answering that about um, specialization. We will do our next webinar later in the season. So in the October time period, so be on the lookout for that. Um, Dr. Mendelbaum, I know that you will be traveling and having a great time. So we're, we're probably gonna share your social handles 
um, if you will be, you know, sharing some of your adventures while you're with the national team. So I would recommend that um, you follow him. Again, we'll send those out when uh, we send out the link to this. Um, and you also have a website, do you not? Um, yes, we have a the Curl and Joe website, uh, one, and we also, I specifically uh, have the website. I'll get the handle out here at the end. There you go. So that is his handle. So um, I would love there's his email as well. Um, so again, we'll send this out. Um, but I would encourage all of you to um, be on the lookout for our next one. We'll send you guys a link to our next webinar series um, and a link to this recording. Um, but again, I would uh, encourage you to share this information, um, share this presentation with your, your regions and have them watch it or any athletes in your life, any coaches that could not make it. But I just want to extend a sincere thank you to Dr. Mendelbaum for sharing all of this information um, and recommendations. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I hope everyone has a great evening and um, we look forward to having a wonderful fall season. And good luck in Qatar. So stay cool <laughs> as cool as you can. Thank you very much. Great being here. Yes. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Bye.